This week in Eretz Yisrael, they are learning Masse. In Chutzelorets, New York and everywhere else, they are learning Matos and Masse because last week in Eretz Yisrael they learned Matos on Shabbos when in Chutzelorets they were all learning Pinchas. Because of the double month odor, there was a discrepancy between Chutzlorts and Eretz Yisrael throughout. And everything comes together by Matos Masse. And we then go into the next Shabbos, everybody worldwide, with Parshas Devarim. Because one of the reasons for the three weeks and for the Avelas of Tisha B'Av and the Chorban Beis Hamikdash was the Pirud, was the division amongst Klal Yisrael. So one of the biggest segulas of the three weeks is to come together. And that's why, say the Mephorshim, that when the calendar, how it's worked out, it comes out that the Klal Yisrael comes together by Matos Masse. Now, this Shabbos is Shabbos Mavarachim. And it's Mavarachim, the Chodesh of Av. And we know that it's the Yortzeit Rosh Chodesh. Of, of Aaron HaKoyen, and indeed in Parshas Chukas it says that he was Nifter, but it doesn't say the date. But when it comes to our Sedra, to, to Masse, it does say the date. That it's Be'echod Bachodesh HaChamishi, the fifth month that we are told the date, and it's the only recorded Yortzeit date said in the Torah. And it's a remez because the outstanding stature and the most impressive posture of Aaron HaKohen was how he ran around all the time making Sholem. And therefore, in the Parsha of Chukas, it doesn't say it because it's not the three weeks, but when it comes to not only the three weeks, the nine days, we want to remind people about what Aaron stood for because that was really something which took the cement out of the entire brick wall of Kalal Yisrael and because of the Sinas Chinam that we lost the Beis Hamikdash. So that's why it's befitting to say the date of his yorts to remind you that it was at the first day of the nine days. And the nine days itself, we have to remember that the three weeks are all the Arizal says those three Shabbosas are the biggest Shabbosas. Because since the culmination of Mashiach coming and the Hisoiris and the willingness to reveal himself in each and every generation, every year, is on Tisha B'av after Mincha. So that is the reason why Aaron Akoin was such a symbol and so important to us, especially in the three weeks. Now we know that each and every month has a tziruf of the Shem Avaya. The month of Nisan is Yismechu HaShemayim V'Sogel HaOretz, Kesidron. That's the most chesed, because it's Yud K Vav K in order. I told you before Rosh Chodesh, Thomas, that it's a month of Din, says the Arizal, and we see by the Tziruf that it's Kei Vav, Kei Yud, exactly the opposite. 
of Yud K Vav K. It's Din. But when we come to the month of Av, it's K Vav, which means backwards, the last A and the Vav. And then it's Yud K. So the Arizal says an interesting thing. When we refer to the Shem Havaya, a whole year, we want to say, we don't say out the name Yud K Vav K or anything, but when we want to refer to the Yud K Vav K, we call it the Shem Havaya. Now that spells the Tziruf of Av, because the Tziruf of Av is K Vav Yud K. And that when you pronounce that, that's Havaya. So why in the middle of Cheshven and Teves and Sivan would we refer to the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Yud Kevavke, always as the Shem Havaya, which is the Tziruf of Chodesh Av? And says the Arizal, because since Antishabov, after Mincha, there is the Leda and the Hisoiris and the desire and the Chuka of Mashiach revealing himself more so than any other time. That when we are talking about the Shemavaya in Cheshvan, we refer to the month when Mashiach will reveal himself the Shem Havaya of Av, even in Cheshven, because that's the Tziruf of the month when he has the biggest Ratzon to reveal himself and to come forth. Now we know that this year, Tisha B'Av falls out on Shabbos, and it's a Nidcha. And like I told you, the Halacha is that a moil and a sandik and a via ben on Tisha B'av that is a nidcha, you're allowed to eat. Those three people are allowed to eat because it's a yumptive for them throughout. The Vilna Gon, which the Shari Tzion brings, goes even a step further. And he says, and the world really is not knowing like that, but he holds that if there's a bris on a regular Tisha B'av, not a nitcha, that the father and the sandik are allowed to eat. But everyone agrees when it's a nitcha, they're certainly allowed to eat. Now, in the Mishnah, there is a machloikis between Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, and the Chachamim about a Tisha B'av like our Tisha B'av this year. That it fell out on Shabbos, and we do not fast or do anything of Tisha B'av on Shabbos, and it's pushed off to Motsoi Shabbos. But Rabbeinu HaKadosh in the Mishnah says that kiven de itcha itcha. Once it was pushed off by Shabbos, there's no more Tisha above, and you don't have to motzoi Shabbos fast and do everything that has to be that we do. And the Chachamim v'lo hodu lo Chachamim. The Chachamim did not agree with him, and we paskin like the Chachamim, that when it comes Motsoi Shabbos, you have to keep Tisha B'Av. Why did Rabbeinu HaKadosh say, Kivan de Idcha Idcha? So all the Meforshim and the Mekubolim say, because his Nishama, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, we know, is Minishmas Mashiach, that he is from Davra Melech, that whole line, of family were all Shaykh to David HaMelech. And he felt that on Shabbos afternoon by Mincha that there was a Hiskalis in the world and that 
there was a revelation of the Ratzon of Mashiach to reveal himself. So once we had that, why do we have to go back and do it again? So he held that kivan de idcha idcha, and you don't have to do it, but we do not paskin like that. So we see that there is tremendous, on one hand we have mourning, which represents till Mashiach comes. Klal Yisrael has such difficulties in their existence, but the 400 million years after Mashiach comes, Klal Yisrael will be riding high because we will enjoy and reap the benefits of having been the loyal people of HaKadosh Baruch Hu throughout all of the generations. Now we know that when Moshe Rabbeinu was on Har Sinai and he was on top of the mountain begging for Mechila for the ego, that he said and he said it and it came out Yom Kippur, the Mechila, and we take those words on Yom Kippur like a grenade and we keep throwing it in the tefillah because Hashem, Hashem, the Yud Gimel, Midas HaRachmim is higher than even Shemona Esrei, the world of Atzilos. That Yud Gimel, Midas HaRachmim, the 13 words supersede and go into the realm and the world of Keser. And Keser is even higher than Atzilus. But we find in Parsha Shlach that Moshe Rabbeinu again supplicated HaKadosh Baruch Hu to forgive the people for the Maraglam, the story of the Maraglam. There he also said words of Midas Arachimim, but only nine. And for the ego, Yom Kippur, he said the 13th. Hashem, Hashem, Kael, Rachum, V'chanun, Erech, Apayim, Rav, Chesed, V'emes. So the Arizal says that the 9 and the 13, that there's 9 days from Tish above, from Rosh Chodesh till Tish above, and from Shiva Asr Betam is in Tul Rosh Chodesh is 13 days. That the 3 weeks has in it even though we're mourning and it's a sad time, but it's going to bring out, we're building inwardly the revelation of Mashiach. So we invoke, and it's connected, those Yud and the, the, um, the nine Midas um, and... And he points out and says that if you take the letters before Yud K Vav K, that the letter before a Yud is a Tes, the letter before a He is a Dalid, the letter before a Vav is a He, and the letter before the last He is a Dalid. Now, what does that spell? That's Tes, Dalid, Tes is 9, and Dalid is 4, that's 13. And then the, la- the Vav K, which the letters before, is a He and a Dalid. He and Dalid is 9. It's the 13 and it's the 9 that bring out the Koyach of Mashiach on Tish above. Now, the Sedra of Matos begins with the Inyonim of Nedorim and Shvuas, what a husband could do uh, in regard to his wife and, and what a father can do in regard to a daughter in terms of their promises and their swearing and everything. The only time in the calendar of our year that we take out two Sifrei Torah from the Aron Kodesh 
and we walk around the base of Medrash and everyone kisses the Sefer Torah. And then the two, each one carrying the Sefer Torah, come back to the Omid where the Shaliach Tzibur is standing. And he says, Kol Nidre. Now, Kol Nidre is the theme of the beginning of our Sedra. Because before we can go into Yom Kippur to wipe our slate clean and have complete slicha, mechila, and kapara, we have to first address the issue of that which we promised and that which we said and that which we swore to all of those things because that is a blockage in the road to be able to go into Yom Kippur and have our slate wiped clean. And it is so important, the Gemara says, that if somebody went into Besdin and he swore falsely that they would walk out of Besdin and die right on the spot. Now it doesn't say if somebody's Machal Shabbos or somebody eats treif that he walked out and died on the spot. So we see how crucial the Indian of Nedarm and the Chassam Sofer says that the Pasuk begins in Matos, Vayedaber Hashem al Roshay Hamatos. That usually the Pasuk says, Vayedaber Hashem al Moshe Lemor. That Hashem said to Moshe, and the reason for Lemor is that he then should go and say it over to Klal Yisrael. That's the Lemor. But here it doesn't say that. Here it says, Mo Hashem spoke to Moshe, and then it says, El Roshe Amatos, that there should be, and then he went to Klal Yisrael and said everything that Hashem said, but there was a layer in between the Roshe Amatos. And interestingly, the Chassam Sofer says that a person has to be so careful with his words and it's usually the leaders who draw out from the klal their shortcomings and their frustrations. Because we know that leaders sometimes wanting to be positive go out of their way to say things to encourage the people, to uplift the people. But many times what they say doesn't happen. They themselves don't keep their word. So the, the Chassam Sofer says that this could cause terrible damage by the effectiveness of people in Klal Yisrael when they feel that they were not told the truth by the leaders. They were not told what to do and how to do and what should be it turned out completely something else because the leaders themselves were not cautious in what they said. And that's why our Sedra begins, El Roshay Amatos, because the leaders have to know that you are the one communicating, you're the goodwill ambassador, and you have to be able to carry the message with fervor, zest, and zeal to the people and make sure you do what you say. And that's why we mixed in the Rashi Amatos. And on that vein, I just want to share with you a short story. There was a group of boys in a yeshiva. And they were all from fine homes. But the group together were, were not a good influence on themselves and each one, each other. And they were into some sort of Ponzi scheme and they got into big trouble. 
one of the things that they did before the trouble was they decided they're going to each call up, and this is a true story, because we know some of the names involved. They're going to call, each one's going to call one Rav and ask a phony Shila, a Shila which had no basis, but they're going to fashion it, these yeshiva boys, with some sort of mixture of sensibility and reality so that the Rav would be caught off guard when he's asked. Well, one of the boys, the name that he was given, that he had to call, was Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zecher Tzadik Levracha. And he called him up 12 o'clock at night. And the Rebbitzin answered the phone. And she said to the young man, is your Shiloh an emergency? The Rosh Yeshiv is in bed. Should I go get him out of bed? He said, yes, it's an emergency. Get him out of bed. Reb Moshe then was 90 years old. So he came to the phone, and the Bachar said, I have a, shy, a serious Shaila for the Rosh Hashiv, and he told him the Shaila. The Rosh Hashiv immediately picked up that it was a phony Shaila. So he asked the boy, which Yeshiva do you go to? And the boy did not want to say. So the Rosh Shiva told him, he said, you know, I promise you I'm not calling the yeshiva or anything. You could tell me. And he told him. And he said, which mesechta are you learning? And he told him, but he didn't know where they were up to or anything. And he said, well, you started two weeks ago, so you're probably up to Yud Beis, Yud Gimel. And the Rosh Yeshiva said to the boy, because he realized that this boy was part of a, it just was not, didn't make sense, and it was up to no good. The Rosh Hashiva said, I want you to ask your Rebbe a question in Toysvis. So the boy said, I don't even know the Gemara. So the Rosh Hashiva at 12 o'clock at night with a boy who he knew was fool, trying to fool him said, well, you know, take out a Gemara I'll wait, and let's go over the Gemara. And the Rosh Hashiva went from the top of the Amid to the bottom of the Amid. And this was like 45 minutes later. It was almost now 1 o'clock. And he asked the boy, do you understand it? And the boy said, I heard, I was listening to what Rosh Shiva said, but frankly, it's not clear in my mind. The Rosh Shiva repeated it another three times, and it was almost three o'clock in the morning. And he said, after the third time, now I understand what Toysus is trying to ask on the Gemara. And the Rosh Shiva said, I want to tell you, Akasha, a question that you can ask your Rebbe. And let's see what kind of an answer he'll give. So the next day, the boy went to the, here, the Rabbi Moshe Feinstein spent three hours with this boy who was trying to pull a prank with him. And he came to class, and that was the Gemara. And the boy asked the Rebbe a qu the question. And the Rebbe was stunned. 
He realized the question was an unbelievable good question and that this boy was asking it. He couldn't believe it. But he was honest and he said, I'll tell you the truth, I don't have the answer, but it's an excellent question. Let me work on it during the week and I'll try to come back with an answer to you. And at the end of the week, the Rebbe came into the class and said, I don't know if you even realize how good this question is. And this is the answer that I came up with, and I hope that you will feel you got an answer to the question. The boy came home and went into his room. This is a boy that was around 18 years old. And his parents heard him sobbing, crying in his room. And they came running in, is everything okay? What happened? And the boy stopped crying and he told them the story. I took the time of the Rosh Hashiva, took, took him out of bed 12 o'clock at night, 90 years old. And he gave me the question. And I see the question was unbelievable because my Rebbe couldn't believe it. And the boy said, I'm crying because Rav Moshe Feinstein had faith in me. That boy that week became a changed person and began learning and today is one of the famous Russia yeshiva in a beautiful yeshiva with a beautiful family with Eniklach and what put him on his feet it was having someone interact with him and express belief in him that he can do it. And Reb Moshe went over the Gemara and over the Gemara and over the Gemara till he knew it, till he could appreciate the question and then he gave him the question. The li and this fits in with the Chassam Sofer that I just told you. Because leaders Rosh Hashanah had to realize that how they as role models and people giving over how the multitude should live, what their attitudes should be, what they're saying, what their speech should reflect. It starts with the Rosh Hashanah. And we as parents or teachers or Rabbonim or whatever we are, when we influence people, if we come across with a true feeling of belief in them, they can do it. They can grow. They can thrive. They can do so much. But it has to be sincere and it has to be with love. And that's why Rav Moshe was, from this story, as you can see, a master machanach. Now, we know that right after the Parsha of Nidorim in Matos, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu, we have a score to settle, that there has to be revenge to Midian for what they did so brazenly with Klal Yisrael. And after that, you will be Nifter, and indeed, Moshe Rabbeinu right after that began saying it was Rosh Chodesh Shvat, and he began saying Sefer Devarim, which he did for 36 days. And on the 37th day, he was Nifter, it was Zion Udder, the yard site of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the whole Sefer Devarim in those 36 days was said. But they 
went out and they took a thousand men from each Shevet and they included Shevet Levi and it's interesting that Levi never went out to fight any war. But over here, this was not a question of inheriting the land or getting Eretz Yisrael and a, a fight with the enemy to take possession. This was a reflection on something Nevola also be Israel that had to be wiped out and avenged. And that's why Levi was included. And as a matter of fact, it says in the Pusik that 12,000 men, they took a thousand from each shavit. How could it be only 12,000 if Binyamin, Ephraim, uh, and, uh, and Menashe? were two separate tribes. But that was, they were only two separate tribes when they went into Israel to fight the Canaanim. But when it had to do with a punitive fight like this, Ephraim and Menashe together were only 1,000 and Levi was 1,000 and that's how it came out to be. 12,000. Now, interestingly, when they came back from the war and they were supposed to wipe out everyone, they let the women stay alive. And Moshe Rabbeinu was very angry, the Pusik says, Vayik Sof Moshe. He was very angry and he suspected that the reason that they allowed the women to live was once again that they fell in with the women of Midian. So the heads of war said, not lo nifkad mi menu ish, not one man fell in to do any Avera. So Moshe Rabbeinu asked them if no one did anything wrong. So why are they bringing korbanos? A carbon they bring when you feel you did an Avera and now you have to have a Kapara. So they answered and said, because when we came back from war, Elazar taught us the halachas because we came back with pots and pans and everything. It was all treif. So he taught us the halachas, what has to go into fire, what has to go into water, and we learned the halachas. And the reason that we did it then, after he taught us, is because we had a question. No man did any Avera. But some had a machshava, a thought. And after Elazar explained to us that the pots, the treif seeps in, we thought first you just have to wash the pot thoroughly and it has to be made clean. But then we were told it has to be purged, it has to be put into fire, it has to be... because it goes inside. So we realized then that what goes inside in terms of machshava needs tahara and has to be kashered. And that's why now at this juncture we are bringing the carbon for the machshavas that were there. Now the Medrash says that the Pusik says, Achar te osef elamecha. So we translate the Pusik simply that after you are after you finish the Nakama with Midyan, then you're gonna be Nifter. But the Medrash points out that from the words you can learn differently. It could be that Achar, that means 
after you are nifter, achar teyosef, el amechod, that that's when you're going to still have revenge against them. And the Medrash says that Moshe Rabbeinu took the Avodah Zorah of Paor and he threw it into the ground and it was exactly right across from the spot that he himself would be buried. And every year, once a year, the Paor would pick up its head and that was the Avodah Zorah that made Kla Yisrael trip and fall so badly. So the Paor comes out of the ground and picks up its head into its full length. Moshe Rabbeinu knocks it back into the ground. So says the Medrash. And this happens every single year. And that's what the Pasuk means, Achar Te'asef El Amecha that after your patira, you're going to still be taking revenge, you're going to be putting their Avodah Zorah back into the ground. We have to know that our mission in life is not only while we are alive. We want to see our children, our grandchildren, our Talmidim, that they flourish and grow long after we are here. After we are gone and we're not there to teach them every day, but the Yesod should be with such Tahara and such Kedusha and so L'Shem Shamayim that even when we're gone that they're still drawing inspiration and growing from the words that we taught, that achar te'osef el amecha, even afterwards. Now, I'm jumping for a moment, because we're running out of time. It says that Pinchas led the fight against Midian. Not Moshe, not Elazar. They didn't participate for different reasons. But on the name Pinchas, the cantillation, which means the trump, is Kadma Viazla on his name. Pinchas Kadma Viazla. So the Meforshim say, and usually the Vilna Gon says this type of a vort. I don't remember if I saw it from him or someone else, but. There were many like this that he said, so it could be he said this also. Kadma means to be makdim, to be up front from the first, way in the beginning. Why was he the one, Zoicha, to go out now against Midian? Because Kadma, in the beginning, he was the run the one before anyone else to come out and confront Cosby Basur with Zimri Ben Solu. He was the one who was Kodam. No one else jumped forward, but he did. And that's why Vaazla, which means to go further, to go forward, that he was the one chosen to lead the, the rebellion not a rebellion, but to wage the war and lead the waging of the war against Midian. Now, we know that the Sedra of Masse, I mean, first of all, I want to say to you that in Matos, two tribes, B'nai, the Ruvain, B'nai Ruvain and B'nai God came to Moshe Rabbeinu and they said that we want to really stay on this side of the Yardin, not to go into Eretz Yisrael, because we have a lot of mikna, a lot of cattle. And it's very, very, the lush landscaping is proper and very good. It's a lot of greenery over here. So it says that Moshe Rabbeinu said, what, you're going to be sitting here comfortably 
and your brethren are going to go and have to fight the 31 kings in, in Israel, and there it's Israel. So they said, no, no, no. We will go in before them even. We'll lead the charge. And we will be there for seven years. And by the Chalukah, another seven years, we'll stay also. We won't go home to our families for 14 years. Now Moshe Rabbeinu accepted that they would go in first for seven years to fight. But after the fighting was over, he allowed them to go back to their families. They didn't have to stay another four, seven years. So the Hasidim teach umikne rav that we know that the two shvatim that were closest to Moshe Rabbeinu was Ruvain and God. Mikne Rav, which means simply that there was a lot of cattle, but you could touch it. Chasidish Rebbeim said, Umikne Rav, they had a Kenyan Rav in their Rebbe Moshe Rabbeinu who was not going to go into Eretz Yisrael, so they wanted to stay with him, Eva Layarde. Ela Masse, the first letter of Ela is an Aleph, and Mase is a Mem. So the Mephorshim say Mase means the travels, that Klal Yisrael is going to be in Golos. Who took out from the first Golos Klal Yisrael? It was Aaron and Moshe. The Aleph the first letter of Ela is Aaron, and the Mem is Masse is Moshe. Who was the who were the ones who saved them from Achashverosh's decree to be killed? Esther and Mordechai, Aleph and Mem. And when Mashiach will come, it'll be Eliyahu, Hanavi and Mashiach. That's the Alpha Mem. So Kadmoinim say on this Pasuk, and as a matter of fact, they say further, Ela Masse B'nei Yisrael. Ela, the first letter is Aleph, it's Edom, that the Golos we've been in for 2,000 years is called Edom. Masse is Modai. B'nei is Bavel. And Yisrael is Yavan. These are the four Golosan. And as Tzaddikim said that these 42 travels, there were 42 Masos that the Pasuk tells us they went from here to there and they encamped. Then they went on to here and to there. There were 42 that it's really the travels of every person's life. Like when Reb Mendel of Vitebsker, who was really not a Talmud of the Baal Shem, but when he was younger, he was brought to the Baal Shem, and the Baal Shem Tev took out a paper and showed him on a paper, there was a picture or a map, and he, he started to show, and he said, these are the journeys of your life to Reb Mendelevitebsker, where he would go, and no one who was there understood what he was saying. But years later, they asked Reb Mendele, when he moved to Eretz Yisrael, when you were younger, the Baal Shem Tev showed you that you're going to go through life, and it was like all in code, so no one understood. Where do you think you're up to? And he said, I'm three quarters through the journey, meaning he understood everything that the Baal Shem Tev was saying to him. And we know that
Every Jew has trials and tribulations and journeys and bumps in the road and difficulties and different things. But every Yid traveled then with the full emuna of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of what will be and what will happen. And that's what carried them through the test of time of what they had and what they had to do. Likewise, we have to be maminim, that everything that happens to us comes at a time with great passion and great seriousness, but we have to know that we're not in the driver's seat. What I would want to say to you is that we find in the Parsha that there were six cities or a miklot, someone who killed unintentionally, and he had to flee because if the family of the person who was killed unintentionally found the man on the street, they were allowed to kill him. Didn't have to go to a bezdin, didn't have to do anything. And if he got into the Ari Miklot, they were not allowed to touch him, and he remained there the remainder of his life until the Kohen Gadol died, and then he was allowed to go home. But besides these six cities, there, there was, there were 42 Ari Halavim. That means the Levim did not have a Chalik a portion of land in Eretz Yisrael. But they had cities, 42 cities where they had houses, where they had their corn or where to be. And the person who killed unintentionally was allowed not only to run to one of the six or a miklot, but he could run into one of the 42 cities where the Levium lived. Now, why is that Indian about the 42 cities and the six Ari Miklot in this Sedra? So say the Kadmoinim that in Shema Yisrael there are six words. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echod. And if you continue on to Viahavta, to Uvisharecha, there's 42 words. The first paragraph of Shema. Because Ayyid has to know that through his 42 travels, no matter what happens, it's the Shema Yisrael, it's his Hamuna and HaKadosh Baruch Hu that carries the day and saves him. It gives him the stamina, and it gives him the power and the ability to move on in life despite what's waiting for him around the corner. And that's why Shema Yisrael with the six words and the Ahavta in Tol Uvisha Recha carries the day for each and every year that we envelop and immerse ourselves in the words of Shema Yisrael and the words of Yehavta and Tol Uvisharecha. Now, I want to conclude with a famous question that the Arizal discusses. And that is, why is it that after the B'nai Ruvain and B'nai God asked for permission to remain there was half of the Shevet of Menashe included? If it was something with Menashe, so why not the whole, the whole Shevet? And if it was and they had nothing to do with it, so why even half 
should be allowed, and they allowed half went in to Eretz Yisrael and half remained out. So the Arizal says that when Yaakov Avinu got married, he thought he was with Rachel. And the Pasuk says that Vayahi Baboker was in the morning, Vihinehi Leah, and he discovered it was Leah he was with. So when he was with her, though, he thought he was with Rachel. Now, Al Pi a person, a man, is not allowed to have any foreign thoughts when he's with, he's intimate with a wife that he's with someone else, chas v'sholem. Not allowed to think such a thing. And here Yaakov Avinu, the Bechir Sheba Ovos, the biggest of the Ovos and everything, Teferis, thought he was with Rachel, and he was with Lemaiseleah. So that caused what we call a Pagam, that tiny because he did it he did it wasn't his fault he thought it was. now Lavan gave maid servants he gave Bilha to Rachel and he gave Zilpa to Leah Rachel before she gave before she had Bilha be intimate with Yaakov, she told him. But Leah did not tell Yaakov that he was going to be with Zilpa. And who was born from, the, so who was born from Leah with Yaakov? Ruvain. Who was born from Zilpa with Yaakov? And Yaakov thought he was with Leah. He didn't know, says the Arizal. God. So Reuven and God could not come into Eretz Yisrael because there was a drop, even though it was innocent and he he didn't do anything wrong or anything. It was he was tricked into this with love on. But they couldn't come into Eretz Yisrael. Now, in every neshama, every person, there are two chalokim. One chalik is from the father, his ruchnius, and one is from the mother. Now, Dina was violated by Chamor, Shechem ben Chamor by Shechem, and they had a daughter, was born named Osnas. And when she came home, Dina, with her daughter, Yaakov Avinu, did not want her in the house. So he had a, put a kamea on her, and it said, Osnas bas Dina bas Yaakov. And she wore it, and he sent her down to Mitzrayim. She ended up in the house of Potiphar. And Yosef didn't marry a goy, he married his niece. It was his sister, Dina's daughter, his niece. And that became his wife. Yosef's wife was Osnas. And they had two sons, Ephraim and Menashe. Now Menashe was the older one. So when a child is born, half of his ruchnius is from his mother and half is from the father. So Yosef was complete Kedusha because his father and mother was Yosef, uh, was, was Yaakov and Rachel. So, so the half from him that went in was Kedusha, Kadosh. But the half that went from Osnas into Menashe was her, half of her was Dina, his mother, her mother. But half was Shechem. And the half which was Shechem went into Menashe. 
So Menashe had half of his Ruchnius was Shem, Tumma, he was Tome, and half was Kedusha from Dina. Ephraim had both Chalakim, the other half of Asnas was Kedusha, was her mother, Dina. And the other half and the other half from Yosef was all, he was all Kadosh, both sides. So Ephraim had two Chalokim in him from the father and mother Kedusha. But, but Menashe had one half was Tuma and one half was Kedusha. And that's why Yaakov Avinu realized it and he said, that he had to give the bracha to Ephraim, that he put his hands, he mixed his hands, because he said, Yadati bini Yadati, I know what I'm doing here. But Menashe, who was half from that half and half from Kedusha, half was able to go into Eretz Yisrael, but the other half had to stay out together with Ruvain and with God. Chazak, chazak, v'nis chazek.